You are now listening to Mark's Unexplained World by Mark the Medium from Hinkley Community Radio, a non-profit podcast radio station. Tonight's episode is about Daniel LaPlante, the murderer in the walls. Daniel J. LaPlante is an American convicted murderer who is currently serving multiple life sentences for the 1987 murders of Priscilla Gustafson and her two young children named Abigail and William Gustafson in Townsend, Massachusetts. However, Daniel J. LaPlante's offences prior to the Gustafson murders by about a year take us on a very dark story that could just as easily be a work of fiction. Daniel J. LaPlante dated a young girl named Tina Bowen after they became well acquainted following several phone calls. However, when he arrived on the Bowen's doorstep Tina Bowen was somewhat shocked to discover that the boy she had been talking to on the phone was the complete opposite of the person of whom and what he claimed to be. But young Tina Bowen was a very polite young lady and went ahead with the date anyway. It was during their date that Daniel Sorry, Daniel J. LaPlante found out that Tina and her sister Karen had recently lost their mother to cancer, leaving only their father to look after them. Unsurprisingly, Tina Bowen decided not to see Daniel J. LaPlante again, following their one and only date. So, it was a short while after this that one evening, Tina and her sister Karen decided to attempt to contact their deceased mother by using a Ouija board and performing a seance in the basement. At first, nothing happened, but over time, Karen and Tina Bowen started to receive a rhythmic knocking noise against their bedroom walls as they tried to sleep. So, was it the spirit of, their, of the girl's mother? Or was it something far more sinister? Greetings, Unexplainers. Thank you for tuning in again and listening to this episode of a very strange tale from Mark's Unexplained World. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm a psychic medium, a ufologist and a true crime buff. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the strange story surrounding Daniel LaPlante, otherwise known as the murderer in the walls. And this week's necessary disclaimer... This story is a tale that sadly involves sexual assault and the murder of young children, so may prove upsetting to some. You listen at your own discretion with all opinions and comments being strictly my own, but the facts of the case still remaining. I also apologise, again, if I pronounce anything incorrectly. My English, although it is my first and only language, ten tends to speak out only to annoy everyone else. But back we go to the story. First of all, who exactly is Daniel LaPlante? Well, Daniel LaPlante was born on the 15th of May back in 1970 in Townsend, Massachusetts. It has been reported that he suffered a very traumatic childhood. However, very little is actually known regarding the specific details of his upbringing. Daniel LaPlante had his first run-in with the law when he was only a minor, which meant that details of the incidents were kept anonymous. He had suffered with much sexual and psychological abuse at the hands of many adults in his life. These adults included Daniel LaPlante's father, who administered the majority of his son's punishments by allegedly tormenting him physically, 
emotionally and sexually on a regular basis. And also, unbelievably, the man who was supposed to be helping him with his mental health, his psychiatrist. He started to make sexual advances towards Daniel Laplante and then, the following year, started to sexually abuse him during their sessions. Daniel Laplante's troubled upbringing had affected every part of his young life. Struggling both academically and socially at school, and in addition to that, he had also been diagnosed with dyslexia from a very young age. And not being the social animal you would expect he was, he had very few friends throughout his school days, with most of his classmates at North Middlesex High School in Townsend, Massachusetts, referring him to be as creepy or weird. In his early teenage years, Daniel Laplante, due to his abnormal behaviour, general reluctance towards his appearance and his lack of hygiene along with his negativity towards any self-improvement, was referred by the school officials to see a psychiatrist. Seeing a psychiatrist could have been a positive turning point in young Daniel Laplante's life if it wasn't for the tragic circumstances which arose at the time. However, it was, at, it was here at this point that Daniel Laplante was diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder, which was something that didn't work well with his already deteriorating mental state that had occurred as a result of his troubled life at home and school. On a quick interesting side note here, hyperactivity disorder, which is now known as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental I'll try that one again, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by an executive dysfunction with occasioning symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and emotional dysregulations that are excessive and pervasive. Inattention, hyperactivity or relentlessness in adults, disruptive behaviour and impulsivity are all common in ADHD. Academic difficulties are often frequent as are problems with lasting relationships. The signs and symptoms can be difficult to define as it is hard to draw a line at where normal levels of inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity end and significant levels requiring interventions begin. As I mentioned earlier, Daniel Laplante's relationship with his psychiatrist eventually took a dark turn when the psychiatrist made sexual advances towards him. Then, for the following year, this same psychiatrist sexually abused Daniel Laplante during their sessions. This obviously would have been something which in no doubt left a huge negative impact on Daniel Laplante's psyche. Because this psychiatrist, like his father before him, was a person who had been trusted to care for the young man, but instead just added another layer of pain to his already damaged and dark existence. As Daniel Laplante grew up in his early teens, he became established as a small-time thief, spending most of his evenings breaking into the local towns and area properties and stealing people's valuables. However, it wasn't just stealing people's valuable items that gave him some form of gratification, as the more he burgled, the better his skills improved. And not only that, but so did his gift for tormenting the minds of the victims whose houses he raided. By the age of 15, he wasn't only breaking into people's homes and taking their possessions, 
he also began leaving behind various other items for his victims to find the next day. And just to really mess with the victims' minds, he would also move objects and items around in people's homes, but in such a way that it was clear someone had entered the property, but not so much as so that it was immediately obvious. Eventually, he was invading his people's homes purely just so he could mess with his victims' minds. In 1986, Daniel Laplante had managed to get hold of the telephone number and address of the Bowen family, who lived in the local area. I think it's reasonably safe to presume that he probably burgled the Bowen family home at some point, and somehow he had managed to retrieve the telephone number, although I must point out here that this is just a hunch, and I can't find anything to confirm this theory. The Bowen family consisted of the father, Frank Bowen, and his two daughters, Tina Bowen, aged 15, and Karen Bowen, aged 9. Over a period of time, the two daughters, Tina and Karen, began to converse with Daniel Laplante over the phone. The disturbed young man told the two sisters that he had been given their phone number by a friend who went to the same school as them. He also told them that he was good-looking, athletic, blonde and a well-educated boy who lived local to them. However, and still over the phone, 15-year-old Tina Bowen started to become quite smitten with the young Danny Laplante, so much so that they arranged to go out on a date one evening. When Daniel Laplante arrived at the Bowens' home, eagerly awaiting for his date with the young Tina, she was somewhat, um, how do you say it? Shocked? Gobsmacked? Stunned? And even a little perplexed? at the sight that she had waiting for her when she opened the door. Mainly because the athletic-looking jock-type stud that she was expecting to arrive turned out to be nothing more than a dishevelled, greasy, spotty, dark-haired boy who had the sex appeal of a road accident. And to discover that this boy had more than slightly oversold himself was something she would probably have won an award for as she tried to cover up her disappointment with some sterling acting. However, if Tina Bowen was anything, she was a polite young lady, so much so that she let young Daniel Laplante take her to the local fair. They chatted for about an hour, and then Tina made her excuses and returned home. Blind dates, eh? <laughs> it was during this date that Daniel Laplante discovered that Tina and Karen Bowen had recently lost their mother to cancer, leaving only their father, Brank Bowen, to care for them. Daniel Laplante allegedly took great interest in that fact, especially regarding the details of Tina, Tina's mother's death. On a later interview with Tina Bowen, she claimed that she felt as though Daniel Laplante was obsessed with the details of the death of her mother, and that throughout their date he continuously questioned her on, the, on how she felt the moment she died and how much mother had suffered. As you can probably imagine, Tina Bowen and Daniel Laplante didn't go on any more dates. A few weeks later, one late evening, whilst their father was out at work, Tina and her sister Karen thought it would be a great idea if they attempted to contact their deceased mother. 
They decided to do this by first performing a seance in their basement. I should point out here that some sources say that the girls used a Ouija board down in the basement, but same old, same old, as I always say. The girls did this more as a boredom breaker rather than for any other reason, so they performed this seance in the basement purely out of teenage naivety and curiosity and didn't really expect anything to happen, as so many don't. Later on, that same evening, however, as the girls were trying to fall asleep, both Karen and Tina received a rhythmic knocking against their bedroom walls. To both the girls, it appeared as though their seance in the basement had been successful. So now, in the middle of the night, both Karen and Tina spoke to this unseen force as though they were talking to their mother one more time. They communicated by asking the spirit questions, to which it replied with knocking against their bedroom wall. It appeared to the girls anyway that they had truly uncovered a spirit force at work. This paranormal communication between the two sisters and spirit continued for several evenings. In fact, it became so regular that if anything, it started to disturb the girls' sleep. As time went by in the Bowen household, various other strange things began to happen. For example, objects in the house began to simply vanish. Items that were laid out on the table one day would find themselves strewn across the floor the next day. And the girls would often return home only to find that all their furniture had moved from one side of the room to the other. Eventually, both the sisters, Karen and Tina Bowen, stopped believing that this entity was the spirit of their mother, and instead believed that they were being haunted by a malevolent demon. After some time, and after many of these unexplained happenings around the home, the girls decided to speak to their father, Frank Bowen, and explain to him that, due to their seance sessions in the basement, they believed that they had unwittingly invited and allowed a vengeful spirit to enter their home. However, Frank Bowen, being a practical man, was having none of it, firmly believing that it was the girls themselves who were causing all the disruption in the home. He refused to believe such absurdity could be real, so he instead highlighted the fact that both of his daughters were emotionally struggling with the recent death of their mother. One evening, in the January of 1987, while the two sisters, Karen and Tina Bowen, were alone in their front room, the strange knocking started up again. However, at this point, the constant tapping, banging and rapping on the walls had all become so commonplace to them that it was starting to drive the girls insane. Although, on this particular particular evening, it appeared that all the noises were not only coming from the walls, but they were coming up from the basement as well. So, the two girls, feeling much braver than brave, grabbing the nearest kitchen knife, slowly made their way towards the basement and the source of the noise. As they gently crept down the steps to the darkened basement, they turned on the light, only to be greeted by a frightening sight. There, in front of them, written in blood red on the basement wall, was the message, I'm in your room, come and find me. Not surprisingly, and without any hesitation, the two sisters rushed out of the house, faster than a greased pig in a bacon factory and went straight to the safety of one of their neighbours next door. 
There, shaking with fear and terror, the girls waited for their father to return home from work and told him of what they had discovered in the basement. But once again, Frank Bowen was having none of it, believing that it was actually his two daughters who were responsible for the defacement of his basement wall. So, he then ordered both girls, Tina and Karen Bowen, to undergo grief counselling to help them both with what he believed to be the source of their struggling mental health, the grief of losing their mother. A few weeks after this first event, in, sorry, I'll try that one again. A few weeks after this uh, this first event occurred, there you go, with the writing on the basement wall, another event happened that was similar, but with an even stranger twist. It all started off again with the two sisters hearing more knocking sounds. However, this time the noises came from behind Tina Bowen's bedroom wall. So, with the two girls feeling brave again, they slowly entered the bedroom and turned on the light, where they were greeted with another message on the wall, again written in blood red, that said, I'm back, find me if you can. The scenario played out the same as before, with the two sisters seeking safety at a neighbour's house, and the father, Frank Bowen, placing the blame for the defacement of the bedroom wall solely on his two daughters. The two girls had this time called, f called their father by telephone from a neighbour's house and pleaded for him to come home from work. When Frank Bowen arrived, he decided to march straight into the home and to prove, and sorry, and prove to the girls once and for all that there was no one else inside. However, when Frank Bowen entered the home, he noticed that there, that there had been further disarray than what his neighbour and his daughters had previously told him. It then became obvious to the girl's father that someone had been inside their house when the girls and their neighbour were all assembled outside. Frank Bowen, alone in the house and realising that he had a trespasser in his, uh, in, a trespasser in his home, sorry, what's wrong with me, <laughs> entered Tina's bedroom, where he saw an additional message in red that had been painted on the wall saying, Marry me. Then, when he looked at the other side of Tina's bedroom, Frank Bowen was greeted with an even more bizarre sight. Because there, on the other side of the room, stood a young boy. Now, that alone would be frightening enough, but this young boy was dressed in the clothes of Frank Bowen's deceased wife. It was reported that this intruder was wearing his wife's makeup, her dress, and a blonde wig. But the most concerning thing, as if there could be any more, was that in the hands of this young boy was a small axe. The young boy was none other than, yeah, you guessed it, Daniel Laplante. A struggle ensued between Daniel Laplante and Frank Bowen. However, the young boy was able to escape. Frank Bowen recalls being amazed at the way Daniel Laplante was able to just disappear out of sight without any effort. However, when the police were called in later the same evening to investigate, it became clear how the young boy Daniel Laplante was able to vanish so quickly. The first thing the police did was to search the house for clues on how Daniel Laplante may have been able to gain access to the Bowens' home. Then, finally, after much searching, one police officer found a hidden crawl space behind a cupboard which was built into the wall of Tina Bowen's bedroom. 
when the police officer opened this hatch to the hidden crawl space, he saw, curled up inside, Daniel Laplante. The police officers then removed Danny Laplante from the crawl space and placed him under arrest. Then, the officers conducted a thorough search of Danny Laplante's crawl space residence, and to their shock, horror and amazement, they discovered that Daniel Laplante had actually been living inside the walls of the Bowen family home. The police found that the passageway in which they discovered Daniel Laplante had been tunnelled around to other areas of the house, where a handful of peepholes were dotted around, so that the young boy could spy on Tina Bowen from whichever room or location she was in. It was then that it became clear to the Bowen family that Daniel Laplante had been pretending to be the spirit of Tina and Karen, Bowen's deceased mother, in order to both tease and torment them. It is also believed that Daniel Laplante was planning on revealing himself to the girls while dressed in their dead mother's clothes. Whether the young man was genuinely trying to pass himself off as their mother's spirit, or whether he was just dressing up to terrify them, remains unknown. To be honest, I think the fact that he was wielding a small axe at the time he was caught suggests to me that the sisters Tina and Karen Bowen had a very lucky escape that night. Oh, and the graffiti on the basement and bedroom walls was actually written in tomato ketchup. Let's take a slight detour from the story just for a second with an interesting side note. The term for someone who is living secretly in your home is called frogging. The word is thought to have originated from the metaphorical idea of people or frogs leaping from home to home. The typical frogger is someone with nowhere else to live. They thrive on staying hidden and are most likely to be hidden in rarely visited parts of the home, like the attic, basement or crawl space. One of the most high-profile cases of this type was when singer George Michael found a stalker who had been living under his floorboards for four days back in 2012. And in another example from 2008, a Japanese man discovered a homeless woman who had been living on the top shelf of his wardrobe after footage from a security sorry, sorry, that again from a security camera revealed she had been eating food from his fridge. So go check your cupboards, wardrobes, basements, and lofts, people. You done that? Good. Anyway, I digress. Back to the subject at hand. The following year, the young Danny Laplante was placed into a juvenile facility where he remained until the October of 1987. However, as soon as he was released, he went straight back into the only life that he knew best burglary. And it was during one of his burglaries in the November of that same year, 1987, that he managed to get his hands on two handguns from a neighbour's house. On the 1st of December 1987, Danny Laplante then broke into the family home of a nursery school teacher, Priscilla Gustafson. The Gustafsons lived around half a mile from Danny Laplante's own family residence. There, Danny Laplante was greeted by a Priscilla Gustafson, aged 33 at the time and pregnant, and her two young children, seven-year-old Abigail and five-year-old William. Priscilla Gustafson's husband, Andrew, was at work when Daniel Laplante broke into his home. And so, upon his return, he met—sorry, he was met with the most harrowing sight of his existence. 
His pregnant wife, Priscilla, was found face down on her bed with her pillows covered in her own blood. By all accounts, Daniel Laplante had raped her and shot her multiple times at point-blank range. Husband and father, Andrew Gustafson, called the police at once, who then discovered that Daniel Laplante had also drowned both of his children, seven-year-old Abigail and five-year-old William, in two different household bathtubs with William having been drowned in the upstairs bathroom and Abigail having endured the same fate in the downstairs bathroom. It wasn't very long before the police managed to link the Gustafson family murder with Daniel Laplante, so a manhunt was quickly ensued. Daniel Laplante was then considered by the police to be armed and very dangerous, and given his history, there was no telling what he might do to avoid being caught. Reports had come in from a few towns over from Townsend, where he lived, that Daniel Laplante had broken into a woman's home and kidnapped her in her own vehicle. Luckily for her, the woman managed to escape, but Daniel Laplante was spotted by someone who had seen his photograph on the news. The police eventually found Daniel Laplante hiding in a dumpster just 48 hours after the manhunt for him had started. And when the police inspected him, they found a hair belonging to Abigail Gustafson on one of his socks, cementing his involvement with the Gustafson family murders. A year later, Danny Laplante was sentenced to three life sentences for the murders of the Gustafson family. Since his imprisonment, Danny Laplante has shown little to no remorse for his actions towards the Gustafson family. While obviously suffering from a multitude of personality disorders and probably other mental health issues as well, Daniel Laplante continues to show that he is a man who cannot be repaired. Also, from what I can gather, between the years of 1988 to 2014, Daniel Laplante attempted to sue the courts multiple times for, wait for it, the violation of his religious rights. Apparently, he claimed that the prison system violated his rights because he was an alleged practicing Satanist. Therefore, when he required sufficient materials in order to carry out these certain satanic rites, they had been denied by prison officials. Whatever rocks your boat, I suppose. Daniel Laplante appealed his sentence in 2017, but fortunately for the general population, this appeal was denied, and so therefore he will be spending the rest of his life behind bars, with absolutely no chance of any early release. Sadly, Laplante's final victim, husband and father, Andrew Gustafson, passed away in 2014, so unfortunately he wasn't around to hear of his family's killer being incarcerated, with life behind bars. It does appear, though, that on Andrew Gustafson's deathbed, he allegedly claimed, and I quote, Don't ever let him out. He should rot in prison. Well, I would say that if he did say this, Andrew Gustafson got his wish. Thank you all for taking the time out to listen to this episode of Mark's Unexplained World. In our next episode, show number 90, we're going to be looking at the disappearance of the Amber Room. The Amber Room was a chamber that was decorated in amber panels, backed with gold leaf and mirrors, located in the Catherine Palace of Sarkoicello, near St. Petersburg. After the war, the Amber Room was never seen in public again although there have been reports which have occasionally surfaced stating that pieces of the Amber Room survived the war.
This show was written and researched by myself, Mark Hughes, and proofread and edited by Linda Hughes. Pronunciations of all the names and places, though, was all mine. <laughs> all the mispronunciation. The actors in this episode were just myself, Mark Hughes. Uh, I've had a few technical problems this week, guys, so uh, Linda will be back with us next week. With special thanks to Neil Packer and the staff at the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre in Hinkley. And a big thank you to everyone for listening. Mark's Unexplained World, because there's more to the paranormal than meets the third eye. And remember guys, keep it real, because being real is better than being perfect. This show and all its contents are covered by the basic copyright of Mark the Medium. (laughs) 